Thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast, you're watching a conference of the 2020 International Web-Based Neurosurgery Congress. I'm very glad to introduce you Dr. Mark Richardson. He was the director of the PLFC a Movement Disorders Surgery Program at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where he founded the Brain Modulation Lab, which is a human systems neuroscience lab studying brain, electrophysiology, and behavior in patients undergoing surgery for epilepsy and movement disorders surgery using intracranial recording and simulation. Nowadays, he is the director of functional neurosurgery at Massachusetts General Hospital and associate professor of Harvard Medical School. Today, at the IWBNC, Dr. Richardson will be sharing with us his lecture titled Modern Epilepsy Evaluation and Advanced Treatment Options. Please type your questions in the Q&A section followed by your affiliation. We will read the questions at the end of Dr. Richardson's intervention. With that, I ask that give your full attention to Dr. Richardson and help me in welcoming him. Dr. Richardson? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone, for uh, tuning in here. And if you sat through the first one and you're sitting through the second one, I appreciate that. And hopefully, it'll make it worth your while. Uh, and it's Friday afternoon. Maybe you grabbed a beer in between or something. Um, so I'll try to finish within 40 minutes uh, so we can be sure to have time for questions. We had some great questions uh, at the end of the last one. All right. Let's start with these two problems. So first one, of course, that epilepsy surgeons have to address is epilepsy itself, uh, you know, which would be hard enough if everyone who was a candidate for epilepsy surgery uh, was actually pursuing it. But we have this other issue, which is underutilization of epilepsy surgery too. And so uh, now every talk that I give about epilepsy surgery, I essentially I start with this problem because I think one of the reasons that potentially that it takes so long for people to get um, from surgical candidacy to an actual surgeon uh, is that maybe we uh, as epilepsy surgeons aren't doing enough uh, to work on this issue. Um, okay, so what am I talking about? Um, I know this is a global meeting, um, but this is the uh, uh, data that I had in other slides. And, and if for anyone who's interested in the, the data on epilepsy in the US, you can look up this Institute of Medicine study. You Google this, you can find it online. Um, the point is still the same in terms of worldwide application. So epilepsy is uh, really prevalent. Uh, it's behind migraine, stroke, Alzheimer's disease. In the United States, 150,000 uh, new cases a year. All right. Um, I'll just point this out. It costs the healthcare system and uh, you know, our communities and economy a lot of money. Uh, we should not forget that people with epilepsy also have 20 times higher rate of sudden death. So SUDEP, um, not surprisingly, is the most common cause of death uh, in people who have epilepsy. Um, and especially if you reach a point where you're medically refractory and you're a surgical candidate, nine of every thousand of those types of patients uh, will die from SUDEP. So uh, it's, a, it's a real problem and it's one that we should frankly talk to our patients about more. Um, you know, and there have been um, actually a book written on this uh, that includes this as a, as a subject uh, in terms of physicians not speaking frankly enough to their patients about the possibility of SUDEP. So, we know that about, this is from the uh, Quan et al. study, uh, which I think is 2010 now, that about 35% of uh, people with epilepsy are refractory to medication. And when you include people who also have a tremendous amount of side effects, um, even if their epilepsy is um, so-called controlled, uh, that number could be higher uh, in terms of people who would benefit from epilepsy surgery. So that's a lot of new potential surgical candidates per year. Um, let's call it 50,000. When if you look at this study that Dario Inglot did um, several years ago now, um, using um, coding data in the United States, number of lobectomies, and this includes this one includes temporal lobectomies, quite low overall. Of course, all of these 50,000 people don't have temporal lobe epilepsy, but a lot of them do. Uh, a lot more than uh, 500. And since 1990, uh, in the US, the number of hospitalizations went up, but the number of surgeries didn't. 
So, you know, we have a real problem. Um, I, I am hopeful that uh, some of the recent advances that we'll talk about and kind of recent changes in how we think about epilepsy could affect this, how we think about epilepsy surgery. So why do we have this problem? Uh, it's a chronic disease. I think some of the patients themselves uh, uh, lose a sense of urgency. Some of them lose their advocates, which are often their patients. If, if they're someone who has progressed into adulthood um, or who has adult onset epilepsy. Uh, there's a lot of advocacy around pediatric epilepsy, not so much around adult. Uh, there's a real misunderstanding of the risk. So there's a publication from the UCLA group that I didn't post here from a few years ago that um, surveyed neurologists who thought that the rate of complications was something like 30 or 50% of uh, standard temporal lobe surgery when really the, the long-term morbidity um, should be in the range of you know, 3%, 3 to 6%. Um, I think patients meet surgeons too late. Um, I think they, that neurologists feel that they can provide information about surgery just as well as surgeons can, um, but that's not true. And uh, the complexity of really comprehensive care is a barrier. I don't know what, um, that, that one is one of the hardest to tackle. Um, but it should just be acknowledged, I think. So I'll take you through that complexity in, in a schematic. So um, these are my personal criteria for when someone should be referred for a pre-surgical evaluation. That's any seizures um, on medication, obviously. Um, the definition of someone who's medically refractory is the failure of two adequately um, trialed, appropriately chosen medications. They don't have to be together. And I also think anyone who has a lesion on the MRI that could be epileptogenic and has had a seizure, whether or not um, the, their treating physician thinks that they, their seizures are controlled should also be referred because you have people that sit around for years with a calf mount and the temporal lobe and um, they could be medication free and seizure free if it was just resected. All right. So this is, everyone knows these stages. I'll just take you through to orient you to um, general, my general thinking on this. Um, and to point out that at the stage that someone's gone through the epilepsy monitoring unit and they've acquired this uh, non-invasive data and are presented at conference, there's no reason they can't be referred to talk to a surgeon at this point about the potential role of epilepsy surgery in their disease. And even though many, if not most neurologists might not feel this way with the, um, if you're in a place where, you know, you can provide DBS and RNS and BNS, there really isn't a type of patient who is not a surgical candidate. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to do surgery or that they should do surgery. But um, in my opinion, there, there, there are very few people who are medically refractory who aren't at least a candidate for a device. All right, we might get you know some other non uh, non invasive imaging if it's missing at that point and available, and then so when the patients discuss one way to think about this is the three potential outcomes. One is everyone thinks that the, there's a focal seizure onset and that the net, that the data to support that is concordant. Um, you everyone might say, well, I'm pretty sure it's focal onset, but not sure exactly where. Uh, this is not a home run, or everyone may agree that there's diffuse onset. Let's call it multifocal or maybe primarily generalized. At this point, in my opinion, the person should go again for neurosurgical consultation. And then let's say they, they're in this category of focal seizure with concordant data. We would still want them to go to resection um, despite all of our other new technologies because this is the best chance to uh, render someone seizure free and cure their epilepsy. We also have the potential to offer laser ablation, uh, which uh, for a couple different reasons, depending on what area is treated, uh, may not be as durable. But um, if I had a language dominant hippocampal onset epilepsy, I would probably choose laser. Well, I would I would choose laser ablation first, I think. But I would just say we shouldn't. Uh, we want to uh, avoid the mistake of um, thinking we know what epilepsy patients want to do, which I think is what. Many of the neurologists, even though they're well-intentioned, uh, do. So I really, I don't think any of us should um, uh, should make a judgment about what the patient wants. It's our job to provide them with uh, as many options as we can. 
So in the case where uh, the data is not concordant, of course, the patient needs to go for intracranial monitoring. Um, there shouldn't be an attempt to have our best guess, do something, and then come back for intracranial monitoring. Uh, if that doesn't work, I feel strongly that if it's not clear, uh, we should proceed with intracranial monitoring. That, if um, uh, things work out probably as well as possible for the patient, would lead to resection surgery or laser ablation, uh, which could potentially cure them. But if not, we have two other options now, and that's RNS uh, or DVS, and we'll talk about these. Um, and then let's take the scenario where someone's multifocal or generalized. Um, they may still go for intracranial monitoring if it's not uh, clear that maybe there's not one focus um, or potentially, a, let's say, a frontotemporal network that could be treated. Um, and a person could go through all of these options, or of course we have VNS. And at least in my practice, VNS is the is the last resort. It's one that I think the efficacy data is the poorest. Having said that, I have seen it work very well in patients who aren't candidates for other options or who don't want to do something else. Um, but our preference um, is for um, DBS in terms of devices and specifically for ones that uh, record from the brain. We'll talk about that bias. Okay, so let's talk about intracranial monitoring for a second, uh, because this is going to set up a lot of the, um, the rest of the talk. So this is the way people thought about um, finding a, a seizure focus in North America uh, for many years, um, decades, uh, based on the work of Pinfield and Jasper, who used electrocorticography uh, with patients awake to try to map out the uh, zone that should be resected uh, based on stimulating and causing seizures and based on interictal activity, you know, looking at um, spikes and so on. Um, this idea of, of searching for a focus, uh, delineating um, a focus uh, is captured in the definition of the epileptogenic zone uh, by Luders, uh, which is stated here, this minimum amount of cortex that must be resected or inactivated uh, to produce seizure freedom. So let's just contrast this with um, the kind of philosophy that created stereo EG, which of course is the way that intracranial monitoring um, has been done in Europe um, uh, during the same time. Uh, there, the idea of the epileptic, epileptogenic zone is that um, this, this should be derived from a working hypothesis um, the hypothesis is focused on the clinical seizure, which is the thing that should be cured, not on uh, finding the electrical start. Um, of course, that's important, but that's not the, f the only thing that defines where the seizure starts. Um, and uh, that this region then needs to be validated with electrophysiology, translated into anatomical terms for resection. So, um, in the stereo EG philosophy, the idea of an epileptogenic zone is the site of the beginning and primary organization of the seizures. And so um, this is confusing to wrap your head around, like, are these really different? Um, how does this affect how we think about um, doing surgery? Um, and so I will break this down in a different way, but let me just say it's my opinion that um, uh, the, the SEEG type philosophy, um, which is essentially an epilepsy network um, approach, uh, is really the way to go. Um, and that doesn't mean it still can't evolve uh, and that it's, it's not you know, in a perfect state, um, but I think this provides really the best starting point. And an important thing to recognize, I think about this philosophy is that um, when you think about epilepsy as a network disorder, then you think about seizures as being an emergent property of the network rather than uh, an, an anatomical location that is always going to produce a seizure. And if you can just find that and take it out or ablate it, everything would be okay. Because there, there's a reason that people who have, um, you know, very well mapped out and very concordant data uh, that directs them to temporal lobectomy, have a seizure five or six years later. And that's because some other property of, you know, the, the network emerges um, at some point um, that may, have not, may not have been evident, you know, initially. All right, so how, do, how can we maybe contrast these approaches um, to better understand what this means for clinical decision-making? 
This is one way to think about it. So in a, in the, in a focus oriented approach, the goal is to identify seizure focus. If you don't um, find it um, with non-invasive means, um, then you might not have any surgery or you might throw a non-specific neuromodulation at the patient like thalamic DBS or VNS. Um, and I guess I've set this up to mean identify the seizure focus either um, uh, invasively or non-invasively. Okay, so let's say um, you know, you've done your series of studies, you think you've identified seizure focus, you do a resection or ablation, or that's what would be recommended. Let's say you can't perform that because of eloquent language cortex or a patient doesn't want to do it. Well, you know, you might have enough information to do um, uh, focus directed RNS, or you know, you might not do anything. If you do move forward with the resection or ablation, the next question is a patient seizure free. If yes, everyone's happy. But if not, you get kind of stuck in what could potentially be a vicious cycle, which is uh, this idea that, well, we must have missed it. We missed the focus. There's one thing, we missed it. So let's just go take more tissue, for instance. Let's resect again or let's ablate again. Um, or, oh, that wasn't focused. Maybe focus over here. Let's go try again to identify it um, with in some form or fashion. Um, and, or you might give up essentially uh, and end up over here in nonspecific neuromodulation or nothing. All right, so let's contrast this with the network oriented approach um, where the idea is not to identify the focus but it's to identify the network. Um, so you're gonna set up a hypothesis and then you're gonna think about how the network can be taken offline. So maybe it could be taken permanently offline by resection or ablation, or maybe it could be modulated in a way with network specific neuromodulation. Um, thinking about how to improve the patient's quality of life and not necessarily how to make them seizure free because so far with what we know about DBS and RNS, we can't tell patients that there's a reasonable chance that they'll be um, permanently seizure free. The, the occasional patient, you know, might go uh, more than a year without a seizure. Uh, but for the most part, um, someone is still going to have seizures, at least the way we currently know how to do TBS or RNS. But I think that this type of um, approach allows us to think more about modulating the network and trying to figure out the best way to improve the person's quality of life, which ideally would be seizure freedom, but isn't necessarily. And that can be very important for patients for a number of reasons. Um, of course, this might not work. And so then you can think about um, combining therapies. Um, you can, of course, think about whether or not your hypothesis was wrong and you can reevaluate the whole, whole hypothesis. So of course you could get into the, uh, the same type of vicious cycle here, but I think the chances for doing that are less uh, when you think about this as a network. Um, and so uh, I'm sure there are other ways to think about this, maybe better ways to articulate this, but at least this is how I've, I've um, tried to deal with this um, I, idea of looking for a focus versus identifying the network, which may have one primary focus, you know, that's most important. All right, and I think these are, um, these are some important um, papers to think about in that regard. So it's really Jorge Gonzalez Martinez, who was at the Cleveland Clinic, who now is at the University of Pittsburgh, who, um, who brought this, uh, the practice of stereo EEG to the United States, sort of publishing on it, uh, really forcing us all to read the European literature to learn how to do this and, and think about um, epilepsy surgery differently than the way it had been thought about you know, in the United States before. Um, and Nitin Tandon is an epilepsy surgeon at University of um, Texas, Houston, um, published this nice paper showing how stereo EG had uh, changed his practice uh, compared to the use of just subdural grids. Take a message from that paper was that that group was able to achieve better outcomes in non-lesional cases. So ones where you couldn't say, oh, there's this, there's the area that we need to take out with stereo EG than with subdural electrodes. That's not surprising because of the, the three-dimensional or stereo nature of stereo EG. And I would say that, that these, that uh, stereo EG, at least in the United States, um, combined with the ability of RNS, um, 
it has the potential to allow us to really personalize um, neuromodulation, um, specifically RNS. Uh, and that this is a this is a uh, an interesting kind of combination of um, available uh, technology. At this point, Nathan Sisterson, who uh, worked uh, in, with me in Pittsburgh and now is, is coming to MGH as a neurosurgery resident, has written this nice review paper, which you can check out if you're interested. So um, I pulled some bullet points on stereo EEG, primarily from these two papers, probably borrowed from some others, but these are for the, uh, you know, students or trainees that are out there. Um, these are both two good papers to look at in terms of stereo EEG uh, philosophy. So the crucial step is to define a strategy for electrode placement. Um, the electrode placement needs to test hypotheses, not just the primary hypothesis, but hypotheses about how the seizure spreads and, and ruling out secondary hypotheses. So those hypotheses need to be identified, which are essentially reasons that the surgery you think you um, may end up having to do might fail. There are three types of data. I think we've essentially already talked about that, that are used. Um, it's just important to note that the seizure semiology is very important. Um, it's very important for the surgeon uh, in your clinic to um, ask the patient yourself, what's the, do they have an aura? What's the first thing they feel? Um, uh, get them to describe their seizure to you because you'll often find things that aren't documented correctly in the uh, clinical chart or uh, maybe that someone else just wasn't paying attention to that are important for your stereo EEG planning. And this is from um, Patrick Chauvel's um, paper. And I, I like how um, he's written this to think about the seizure structure and seizure semiology in terms of uh, characters um, that uh, create meaning in language uh, or code and computer programming. Um, so it's important to think about how the symptoms and signs of a seizure, you know, link together to describe the network. So what's called the primary organization of the seizure. Um, the number of electrodes um, depends on the hypothesis. Um, and, you know, people who are less familiar with stereo EEG might say um, it's a pin cushion approach. You just stick things in the brain. Um, and I think that type of comment stems simply from one thing, which is not reading the stereo EG literature and, and trying to understand um, how hypothesis testing um, should be done and thinking about networks and what we know about um, the di how different brain areas produce different parts of human behavior that are manifest in seizure. Um, right. And so it's the team should, um, should contribute to the, to, to the SEEG plan. And I think we've talked about this. Okay, here are examples of, let me check the time here, examples of different types of semiology. And it's, it's just important to know these. Uh, I'm gonna click through them and you can read them on your own. Um, some you may know of that are obvious like deja vu uh, and uh, mesial temporal lobe. Um, auditory hallucination and uh, superior temporal gyrus. It's, it's just important to keep track of these and you'll find even in, for instance, failed epilepsy surgeries um, that are sent to you or even um, you know, at your own center, you may find that someone missed something about uh, semiology and you look back on the PET scan and lo and behold, there was hypometabolism in an area that corresponds to some part of their semiology. So, um, if you can describe the clinical features well, you can then make a hypothesis um, about uh, the organization and propagation of the seizure. And you can start checking that with the rest of the non-invasive data um, like metabolic imaging and neuropsychological testing. Okay, let's see where we are on time. So let me take you through this case, um, which is an example of, uh, what I call synergistic surgery. So this is upfront combination of uh, more than one modality of therapeutic surgery. So here's the case, 34 year old uh, woman, um, epilepsy for 14 years. Here's a semiology, it's, it's uh, visual. 
she loses awareness. Then she has this chewing, head turning, um, features that are consistent maybe with temporal lobe involvement, postictal confusion, frequency, you know, few a week. Um, her inner ictal EEG, uh, maximal left temporal, bifrontal, ictal EEG, onset not localizable, but left temporal evolution uh, in a conjunction with the temporal semiology. Here's PET scan. Um, it's got some temporal occipital hypometabolism, and here's a MEG study that shows dipole cluster and the temporal lobe. Okay, let's see. So we have a primary hypothesis based on um, the first thing that she reports that um, just posterior temporal, some temporal occipital, maybe um, cortical, neocortical origin with rapid generalization to the mesial temporal lobe uh, and the rest of the brain. Um, secondary hypothesis is that it's one or the other. It's actually occipital and it propagates quickly, or maybe it's just mesial and it propagates quickly. Or it's both, that would be another hypothesis. So here was the implantation strategy that we used. And here are the recorded seizures. So the first seizure was recorded from the hippocampus. Um, and specifically the head of the hippocampus, you can see that here. Here is a second type of seizure that was captured. This one um, originating in mesial, mesial occipital leads. You can see that here. And for those of you um, EEG readers out there who might not be convinced about that, I'm showing you the evolution. Here it is again, that same screenshot, and here it is evolving and evolving. So that's that's a seizure and a different seizure than the hippocampal onset. So then one thing that's an important component of um, stereo EG um, that we um, uh, still struggle with, honestly, at both centers in, in, in Pittsburgh, uh, we're, we're doing a lot better job of this uh, now at MGH, but really is getting everyone on board to do stimulation mapping in every uh, case which is an important part of the stereo EG uh, philosophy and technique. Uh, again, because the goal is to map the network. And so you can do that uh, with ev evoke potential mapping um, if you wanna be more sophisticated about it. Uh, but the main goal is to try to produce the seizure aura um, or electrographic um, seizure. And of course we can also use this um, just like we would map through a grid uh, to map eloquent areas, map functional areas. So in this case, uh, mapping through the uh, uh, some of these electrodes, which are numbered here, produced her typical visual aura, uh, which is blinking sensation distortions at different amplitudes at these different locations. The point here is that kind of broadly throughout this area, we could um, we could evoke her aura, so not just one spot. And we're talking about the mesial occipital lobe. So essentially. Um, you know, if not in primary visual cortex, right uh, on the way in there. Um, it, it trying to provoke a seizure with a different type of stimulation, you know, one hertz stimulation, uh, one millisecond at 30, you know, second trains, that produced a seizure not in these areas that produce the aura, uh, but in the um, hippocampus. So, um, Let's see, and oh, here's the seizure that was produced in the hippocampus with stimulation. All right, so we interpreted this data as indicating that there were two, I call them foci here, you might think about it, maybe it's more appropriate to say two, um, you know, the two most important network nodes, at least where we had electrodes um, in the occipital lobe, which produced uh, her typical aura, uh, and in the uh, recorded data, or typical generalization uh, when the onset was occipital, and this hippocampal seizure, which uh, the patient, you know, kind of retrospect admitted was uh, familiar to her as her more recent um, seizure type, uh, and which we could produce by stimulating the hippocampus uh, directly. All right, so the recommendation here um, was to do a left hippocampal ablation. Um, thinking that 
because we know part of the primary organization of the seizures in the occipital lobe doing a language dominant temporal lobectomy here and just hoping for the best might not be um, the optimal course. Um, and we had been doing hippocampal ablation for a while. Um, I've used both the visual A system and the Monterra system. We ended up um, going with the Monterra system uh, and we would use clear point. I think I have an image about that. I use clear point to direct the uh, laser cannula. But the important thing is up front, we recommended to this patient, we're going to take a brief break of a you know, couple of weeks, a few weeks between these surgeries. And then because we know the occipital um, uh, seizure organization area is unaddressed by hippocampal ablation, we're going to come back in and do RNS because we don't think uh, it's reasonable in terms of preserving vision to resect enough cortex uh, in areas generating seizures without producing a uh, potentially significant uh, visual deficit. So this was the upfront plan. And, you know, the efficacy of this type of strategy is to be determined, you know, the more we attempt to do this, but um, I think it's safe to do this and um, it potentially saves the patient a lot of time and a lot of um, um, potentially otherwise lost quality of life as opposed to, well, let's do one and wait two years to see how things go and do the other. All right, so this is what it looked like in our um, setup in the diagnostic scanner, uh, patients prone. Um, this looks similar to how we did do the drug infusions. And as a matter of fact, it's basically the exact same way, except for there's just one tower mounted. Um, here's a laser probe. Um, like I said, we use a clear point software, uh, similar to what I showed in the in DBS talk. Um, here's an example of the trajectory through the hippocampus kind of lined up and ready for insertion in the ClearPoint software. Now, um, I would say probably most centers um, when do laser ablation are positioning the catheter in the operating room with um, either a robot or Lexile frame or a stereotactic frame of choice and then transporting the patient to, to the MRI um, or maybe doing it in the MRIS suite, uh, which can work just as well. Um, we felt our, well, we had the established workflow in the MRI and um, just very confident with the targeting um, accuracy of the real-time MRI. So that, that this was our method. Uh, here's what the ablation looked like. There's a one-month uh, post-op scan where the contrast enhancement um, is overlaid with where the software said we ablated, and it's a pretty close match. Um, so it looks like a decent ablation. And this is a, a post-op image um, of where the RNS electrodes ended up. The device is implanted um, in a craniotomy site uh, in the skull. It doesn't matter which site it's on. In this case, it was easier, I felt, just to route it across away from here um, and, and connect it. Um, I started doing laser ablation for epilepsy as same-day discharge, so same-day surgeries. Um, and the RNS patients typically go back the, the next day, or let's say half of them do, half of them need a couple days um, just to deal with any pain from the incision. It's kind of a horseshoe shaped incision for the uh, cranial implant. Let me check the time. Okay. So, all right, well, what about RNS, uh, you might say? What are the outcomes? Um, and what are the outcomes for that patient? Um, that patient was doing well initially, and I need to get, that's a patient from Pittsburgh, and I need to update the latest outcomes. So I can't tell you that. I'm sure someone would ask, should ask, what, what's the outcome, long-term outcome. Um, here's uh, from the uh, RNS uh, Neuropace clinical trial, now out to nine years of data. This was presented at the American Epilepsy Society meeting a couple years ago. Um, there's some caveats because some of the patients drop out, uh, the error bars are long, but you know, very clearly many people who uh, receive the stimulation have really significant benefits. Like 73% of people who were around to say how it was going at nine years, were still getting greater than 50% seizure reduction. The nine years is a long time after epilepsy surgery. Um, 35% uh, with uh, really you know, significant, greater than 90% seizure reduction in, in the, the last six month period. And I think this is really interesting. You know, there are almost a third of patients that um, have a really long period without any seizures, which 
you know, that will allow a lot of people to return to work depending on the type of seizure they have, potentially you know, drive again. So let me, let me take this opportunity now to um, suggest that our field do away with the term palliative uh, epilepsy surgery, um, because this is not just palliative. Palliative means um, you know, just kind of dampening, um, the, just kind of treating the symptoms. This isn't just treating the symptoms, this is treating the seizures. It's not seizure freedom, but it's also not palliative. You know, the person's epilepsy is better. Um, so I'll, I'll credit um, Sadi Katan, who's a neurosurgeon at Mount Sinai for uh, really harping on that uh, idea um, that palliative is not a word that's really appropriate to use uh, when we're helping patients like this. Um, all right, well, you might say, isn't this data pretty similar to anterior nucleus DBS? And the answer is, yeah, it kind of is, and Medtronic has the, has data that's out, you know, even longer than five years that that shows that the numbers, you know, are continuing to improve in terms of uh, percent seizure frequency change, you know, from baseline. Um, so then, then the question is, well, is RNS really responsive? You know, what's it doing? Why would you, why implant RNS if you could just do DBS and baby get the same result? Or, you know, for those who are in Europe or would have, um, you know, access to the Medtronic Percept, which is also sensing enabled device, although cannot do really closed loop uh, initially, at least in terms of um, what happens out of the box with FDA approval or, or EU approval. Um, you know, why would you do sensing? Well, it's a good question. Um, but I think there are a lot of uh, answers that um, are satisfactory for why you would do that. And so I would just say, I'm, you know, we have a ongoing research in this area, so I am really biased for sensing enabled um, technology. But I think the reason is it's so valuable. Um, and even if we don't necessarily know exactly the best way to use it now that would uh, demonstrably make it better than than um, DPS without sensing, we might in a couple of years or a little bit longer um, or less uh, for any given patient who's implanted. And I think there's gonna be a lot of value in having um, patient, uh, uh, someone's chronic brain data, their, their personal brain data over time. All right, there's a couple of reasons. Um, uh, let's see, I, maybe I didn't rearrange the order here, but this is this relates to seizure prediction. So um, the uh, UCSF neurology group led by Vikram Rao um, showed that uh, really almost all patients, if not all of them have a um, cycle of seizures that uh, can vary. It's not the same for each patient. It can be weekly, it can be monthly, it can be somewhere in between. So multi-day or, or multidian rhythms. And you can imagine if you could predict the time where someone's most likely to have a seizure and you could return that information to them, uh, that would be really helpful. Um, so uh, I think we'll see a lot more work um, in this area. And that's important. And um, here's another one that I think is important, which is um, using the brain information to uh, inform how you might change medications or to assess the effect of medication change. And this is a Yale group that published their data showing that uh, in the first week after medication change, there was information in the recorded ECOGS um, that predicted whether the medication would be efficacious. So I think this is another important area. And here's an example from our, our own work um, looking at response biomarkers. And so, um, uh, Vasily uh, Kokonos uh, in our group uh, manually went through and evaluated about 14,000 ECOGs from the RNS device um, and started seeing some patterns. And when he um, categorized these and then characterized them based on whether uh, they appeared in someone who was responding uh, therapeutically uh, to someone who wasn't, uh, he found that there were um, a number of features that were present only in people who were responders and never showed up in people who um, didn't respond. And that there were also a set of features that um, there were some changes that showed up in patients um, who didn't respond, uh, but those didn't happen in the, in the non-responders. So 
Uh, here's an example of one of them, uh, which is um, dispersion um, or fragmentation of the seizure frequency or shifting as what we call this, where here's a baseline period uh, where the power is really uh, focused in lower frequency um, domain. Um, this is a time frequency plot. And here you can see at week, you know, somewhere in the program, in the programming epoch, which en encompasses weeks 28 to 43 postoperatively, um, there's this real shift during the seizure. Um, and this was not a result of stimulation. You can see stimulation happening here, but these were not effects that happened directly in response to stimulation. Here's another one, which is fragmentation of the seizure. So here's the baseline period. And here you can see this fine comb-like fragmentation. This is something that only showed up in people who responded. And what's the physiologic basis of this? We don't know yet. How does this emerge? We don't know. Um, but we do think it's um, a biomarker uh, that's potentially gonna be useful because um, I just mentioned it showed up, often these patterns showed up before the patient reported they were doing better. So if we can figure out how to detect these in real time, um, it might save us from making an adjustment that uh, might be less uh, beneficial to the patient. All right, I'm pretty close to the end so that we'll have time for questions. Uh, here's an, I call it an emerging concept because we've, we've used responsive neurostimulation. Of course, the treatment of primarily generalized epilepsy with DBS or VNS is not an emerging concept. It's the main way VNS is used. Um, and uh, there are a number of you know, open label um, studies, uh, case series of uh, thalamic DBS and primary generalized epilepsy. Uh, but uh, we had this uh, patient um, for whom we published this case report. And we have a series of about five other patients now um, who have also had uh, class uh, angle class three or better response to bilateral centromedian region um, responsive neurostimulation. So we have the RNS device implanted in the vicinity of the centromedian nucleus. It turns out if you just use anatomic um, targeting, at least like we did, you don't do a very good job of hitting the CM that well. And we're actually recording and stimulating outside of the CM. Uh, which is where the highest amplitude discharges um, are detected. Um, despite that, you know, we have this patient with um, a Javon syndrome, which is eyelid uh, myoclonia with absence seizures, uh, who's had about a 90% reduction in, in clinical seizures and has had total lack of um, loss of consciousness of generalized seizures since um, the device was turned on. And so we thought from the, and I didn't put the slides in, uh, but there's evidence, the reason to expect that um, we would record seizures in the thalamus. Others have shown that in some in older literature. Um, and in fact, we do find the standard spike and wave discharges um, uh, recorded off these thalamic leads. And here's an example uh, from the RNS device. Um, I'll show you this, another figure from the paper. So here's the pre-op scalp EEG of these uh, generalized spike wave discharges that are just classic for um, primarily for different types of primary um, generalized epilepsy, um, so-called genetic epilepsies in the ILAE nomenclature now. Um, this is what it looks like uh, in um, time frequency domain. Here it is recorded on the device. Um, so again, these spike, spike wave discharges. And here it is detected on the device and then stimulation um, stopping the seizure. It doesn't show you here, this is all artifact, but um, in fact, the seizure is aborted. Um, so uh, let me wrap it up here. I think, um, and I showed this at the end of the, the movement disorders talk too, or at least the end of the closed loop DBS part, uh, in terms of the promise of, uh, or potential of sensing or closed loop DBS as to deliver um, really personalized medicine. I think um, this is potentially, at least initially, a better example than a movement disorders because of the experience we have with RNS and potentially the ability to learn um, from stereo EEG uh, and to map uh, what we know about the network onto uh, models of how the RNS might work, uh, which um, hasn't really been done yet. So this is an area of interest uh, in the lab, a goal of which, of course, is to greatly outperform uh, medication. So here's a summary. Um, I think for, for those in, uh, in training, uh, it's important to understand that you really, um, as a surgeon, should also be an epileptologist. Uh, 
uh, in general, early neurosurgical consultation uh, is something that we should, I think, hammer our uh, colleagues about. We want to talk to the patients early so that they're not scared to death of epilepsy surgery and they have a chance to meet the surgeon and hear from the surgeon's mouth what, you know, the potential role of surgery might be. Um, I think using a network approach helps to personalize what we can do. Um, and I do think uh, increasingly we'll be able to show that multifocal or diffuse onset um, epilepsies uh, are uh, a surgical disease um, using responsive neurostimulation. All right, thanks. I'd be happy to, to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Richardson, for your lecture. It has been amazing. The advances in the epilepsy surgery field are very promising, as you explained. We have some questions from the audience. So we have Dang Wu Jong Chang asks. Since the, since the NIH consensus research in the 1990s, the volume of epilepsy surgeries has not really increased. So this is a chronic problem. Why do you think about this? Yeah, um, I don't know the answer. I've thought about it a lot and I still don't know what the answer is, um, but there are a lot of biases um, towards surgery. I think one of the, one of the primary issues is that um, the, the patients themselves as a nature of the disease um, can become apathetic. Uh, they become marginalized to a certain extent in society. There's a real stigma against epilepsy. Um, there's fear of surgery. There's a so-called Frankenstein effect where people get their general information about uh, what's going on in the world by social media, by fiction, by TV shows. And those um, uh, mechanisms tend to dramatize or sensationalize um, things like uh, brain surgery or DBS. And so there's a, this idea that uh, if you had a DBS system or something implanted in your brain, you would be Frankenstonian. Uh, a lot of it is a lack of knowledge. So I think one of the things that we have to do is figure out how to educate the community better um, about what we do. Um, because many people who would be candidates for these surgeries have literally never heard of it. And most of them have never been to a comprehensive epilepsy center. So uh, I, at least in the United States, you know, I think we have a real problem uh, in the healthcare system of uh, identifying these people and, and you know, the, the primary care physicians and the basic neurologists do not understand uh, when it's appropriate to refer someone directly to a surgeon or into the right center. Okay. Carolina Ferreira asks, do you reckon seizure relapse reflects an incomplete network disconnection or could epilepsy be seen as a neurodegenerative disorder and new epileptic networks will inevitable appear? Um, yes, so I think all that could be true. Um, it depends, because everyone's epilepsy is not the same. So the cause of everyone's epilepsy um, is not the same. Um, and in some cases it may work like a neurodegenerative disorder, let's say like a slowly progressive inflammatory problem. Um, so it depends on the etiology. This obviously we don't understand very well, but short answer is yes, I think. Uh, but, but uh, you know, another aspect of that question is, in some cases, the exact same seizure recurs even after years of seizure freedom. In some cases, a different seizure occurs. So, um, right, an example is, um, you know, diffuse focal cortical dysplasia, which you can just keep resecting uh, and is, is going to reemerge, you know, then a network is going to reemerge uh, because of the substrate. So, um, yeah, depends on the substrate. Good question. Okay. Ahmed Nahar asks, what's the software that you use to planning? Is it BrainLab? 
Well, now that we do everything on the ROSA, it's actually the ROSA software that we use for um, all of the seriotactic work, unless we're doing something in the MRI scanner where we use a clear point software. Um, now I have used, uh, before that, I have used a brain lab software. I like it and that's what we had in Pittsburgh. It's what we have at MGH. So for instance, if we had to pre-plan something just practicing and we wanted to do that, Remotely, I would still use Prime Lab because those other two systems don't have um, uh, uh, internet-based kind of uh, portal or platform. You have to do it on a dedicated machine. Okay. Paulo Sanchez asks, Dr. Richardson, after performing a resection surgery, do you consider to stop and convulsion therapy at any point during follow-up? Could you read that part again, Camille, about um, what about adjuvant? Um, he, the question is, if after performing a, a resection surgery for epilepsy, do you consider to stop the anticonvulsivant therapy at any point during the follow-up? Um, yeah, at least the way um, uh, typically works in the United States, we turn the patient back over to the epileptologist and uh, there are a number of different strategies. I'd say the most common one is not to touch anything for about a year, depending on um, what's happening with the patient. Of course, there's situations where um, someone you know, really wants to come off medication, really needs to come off medication. That can be done uh, concurrent with a stay in the EMU or with ambulatory EEG potentially um, to check, but uh, I'd say that's variable. Okay. Thank you, Maturana asks, thank you, Dr. Richardson, for your presentation. What do you do if the symptoms suggest one particular lo localization, but the electrophysiologic uh, workup identifies another area as the origin of the, node of, of the epilepsy? Yeah, well, um, I think the hypo in that case, the hypothesis has to be refined. So. Um, if there's an intracranial monitoring procedure done and um, a seizure is characterized, but the clinical description uh, doesn't match, for instance, the patient feels something or clinically they uh, manifest the semiology of the seizure before it's detected in the intracranial monitoring, then you know that you don't have electrodes in the area that uh, represents the primary organization of the seizure. So you have to refine your hypothesis and, and potentially put more electrodes in or bring the patient back, let's say, for a different procedure. But these really should match. I guess the other scenario would be, um, in some cases, the patient report is just not reliable or they don't you know, describe exactly, they'll describe things the way that you you might describe them. So I think that's one, maybe one uh, important thing, but it's always a problem if the clinical, if the obvious clinical manifestation of the seizure precedes what you record, um, especially with invasive monitoring, then you have not, you, you do not have the electrodes in the right spot and you really cannot make a, a good decision um, about a therapeutic surgery. Okay, great. Mauricio Medina asks, What's your opinion on the role of focus ultrasound for lesional epilepsy? Yeah, I mean, my understanding, Mauricio, is that that is not, um, the technology is not ready for prime time in terms of targeting the hippocampus and conforming uh, the lesion. Um, and um, yeah, short answer is I don't know um, because I haven't done focus ultrasound. I'm not sure about its, you know, its application in other areas, um, you know, just thinking out loud. My, one of my main concerns with focus ultrasound and things have improved, but even just, um, you know, focus ultrasound for tremor had much higher morbidity than DBS, uh, you know, in many of the early reports. And so I'd be concerned about this, the size and control of the, uh, of the lesion. Okay. Daniel Moreno asks, in generalized epilepsy, what experience do you have comparing VNS and chiosotomy with which have you had better crisis control? 
uh, it, combining VNS and corpus calcitomy? It sounds yeah. like that's the question. Yeah, that's, um, that's the question. Yeah, again, the, these, um, it's hard to say because the, the way in which these are applied in generalized epilepsy, especially when you end up in a situation where you might do both, um, it can get, there's no easy answer for that because the, there are potentially different types of epilepsy at play. I will just say, in my, the way I've typically thought about corpus callosotomy is that that is used just for the atonic component of seizures. So essentially for drop attack seizures. Now that's not maybe how everyone thinks about it or has used it. Um, and uh, maybe in younger kids, you, you might think about that differently depending on the type of epilepsy. Um, I haven't, you, let me just think about this. Yeah, via, yeah, in combination. Well, I would just say, I still do corpus callosotomy up front if the main thing that you're trying to treat is, um, is atonic seizure. And I think that, you know, doing the callosotomy actually can help if the disconnection is uh, done well, it, uh, and you bring the patient back in for uh, an EEG study, the EEG can look different. It might help you with, um, you know, what you decide to do next. Uh, so. Okay, David Cadwell asks, Dr. Richardson, thank you for another wonderful presentation. Do you think high density micro ECOG recording strategies offer any additional benefit beyond standard clinical echo arrays for examining the epilepsy network? Yeah, I do. Um, I haven't been involved with any of that work, so I can't really speak intelligently to, to it except for, um, I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of potential there, um, and it just makes sense that 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 should evolve. Um, uh, but like a lot of uh, different types of advances like this, there are um, some centers and even just individuals at centers who do this very well, um, and the potential uh, kind of lags behind the the practical implication or implementation. So I think that's kind of where we stand there. But yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of potential benefit in high density econ. Okay, great. Shirak, Shirak asks, on what basis the target for epilepsy is selected between anterior nucleus versus intermediate nucleus? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the way I've typically thought about it is the, if, if you look at um, viral tracing studies in non-human primates to map out the connectivity of the two, that the anterior nucleus is better connected in the classic PAPE circuit. So it might be better for frontal and temporal onset or frontal temporal network uh, epilepsies. Whereas centromedian um, and um, some of the more, uh, you know, the nuclei in the middle of the thalamus basically are more broadly connected to um, other regions. So they're still connected um, to the temporal lobe and uh, to the frontal lobe, but they're more broadly connected to parietal lobe and um, occipital lobe. Uh, than the anterior nucleus. So um, having said that, it's a real, uh, it's an open question. I will say the other thing about the, um, you, depending on how you do it, you might end up in general with just more electrodes in the thalamus with centromedian because of the transventricular targeting that's needed for the, uh, for the anterior nucleus. Um, and the CM avoids the, the ventricle, but essentially for anything that's frontotemporal, I would um, classically go with the anterior nucleus and anything that's not, I would do centromedian. Okay. Um, Sally Baeza asks, what is your current surgical protocol for intractable drop attacks? RNS is not currently available of the United States. Is it acceptable to place BNS in your epilepsy surgery protocol instead of RNS? Sure. Um, I mean, I think definitely the, uh, especially if um, you know there are other types of seizures uh, at play. But I would still do. I mean, for um, you know, for bad drop attack seizures, I think corpus callosotomy is the is the uh, first maneuver. Um, if it's expected that there are other components of the epilepsy that are not, you know, going to benefit from corpus callosotomy, that 
Um, there's nothing wrong with doing both of them, you know, together or doing it up front even. Um, but of course, you know, not maybe not everyone wants to move forward to corpus callosotomy or a parent doesn't. I think it's a, and actually most, you know, many, many places would do a BNS first. Okay. Um, here's a, another question. What is your opinion about radio surgery for epilepsy? About what type of surgery? Um, uh, radi radio surgery for epilepsy. Ah. Uh -huh. Well, um, you know, so the, the, the large clinical trial for radio surgery, the ROSE trial, um, basically had to stop uh, prematurely. Um, one reason is hard to enroll. So I think the fundamental problem with radio surgery is how long it takes to work, especially now that we have laser ablation. So on the one hand, you can avoid sticking something in the brain. Um, but on the other hand, um, there, there is a lot of swelling that occurs with radio surgery. There's swelling that occurs with laser ablation too, but, but definitely not as much. Um, and uh, most importantly is the, is the time. Laser ablation is, in, is immediate and radio surgery can you know, take up to 18 months. So um, uh, that's, my, that's my general thought. We don't use that in, um, in our practice uh, currently. Okay, um, just to the last question. Uh, what do you think about hypocampal DBS? Campbell DBS. Um, well, um, I'm sure that it works in some patients. Um, I just, the, um, I haven't done it myself. I mean, I have done bitemporal RNS. Um, we know that, that works. So, um, I think there's, there's uh, potentially a role for hippocampal DBS. My preference is to um, use a device where we can record the brain information. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I think there's, there's definitely a role for stimulating the hippocampus and, and um, some types of epilepsy, uh, obviously bitemporal epilepsy, but still an open question about whether the DBS lead should be just right in the hippocampus or should they be in the uh, you know, parahippocampal gyrus? Where should they be exactly? I think we don't know. Great. Okay, on behalf of Sien, I would like to thank you again, Dr. Richardson. These have been wonderful lectures. We are really grateful and honored for your participation in the 2020 International Web-Based Neurosurgery Congress. More than 3,000 people have joined this Congress from over 100 different countries. You are more than welcome. You are more than welcome to stay tuned to watch more lectures from other speakers. In the next conference, we will have Dr. John Chin doing his lecture, Cervical Spinal Deformity, Alignment Considerations and Osteotomy Techniques for Correction. To get the link for this conference, please follow the link pinned on the chat screen or check the agenda on our website, cnfus.com. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. It was being an amazing lecture. Thank you, I really appreciate the opportunity. My pleasure.